All right, this week we're talking for partnerships for crime prevention. So police are obviously unable to handle the crime problem alone. Um, this, you know, it's really interesting to look back at the history of policing and um, how we have gone from only needing to call police in the most extreme issues to what I call today a 911 call a cop, get a cop. And the problem with that is people don't understand that a lot of the issues out there are not police issues. They just don't understand what else there is to do. Um, also, there are some issues that are partly police issues but can't be solved alone. So therefore, there has to be some type of community policing done. Um, it is recognized that community policing is a partnership. Police provide the law enforcement side as far as understanding what the law is, what the First Amendment rights are, um, and assisting that way. But when it comes to your long-term community policing efforts, that's on the part of whether it be the community or businesses or whatever it is. All right, let's go into defining um, what community policing is. First of all, there's no single definition. Um, it is a philosophy of policing, and the reason there's no single definition is because it needs to be malleable. It needs to be moldable for the community um, that's having the issue and what needs to be done to fix it for that issue. It needs community involvement. Um, it takes time. It takes coordination. It takes um, sometimes not fixing it right and going back and continually reassessing what's going on. Um, there needs to be a community base where everybody knows, okay, this is where we go. And again, that's tough to do because everybody's so busy. A lot of people don't want to take that on. That's why it's so quick and easy to call 911 or call your non-emergency number. And hopefully um, that's going to fix it. But all that does is put a bandaid on it and sometimes even make problems worse. All right, problem identification. There is what we call the SARA process for problem solving. And you will see this again because I truly believe in it. SARA stands for how you solve a problem. And I would have officers employ this all the time. I would say, hey, um, we got a lot of burglaries going on in this neighborhood. I want you to there to drive there and do a Sarah um, problem solving model to this. So they're going to drive there and they're going to start with the S, scanning. They're going to identify the problems, talk to people, see what the concerns are, see what's really going on. They have the numbers as far as the crime stats, but they need to see what's going on. The analysis, um, who who does it involve? What can be done to coordinate to fix it? What are all the options? And then the response is, okay, let's respond. Let's get approval through the supervision and let's respond. Let's get the community to respond. And then assessment. You need to always be assessing what you're doing because it may work um, during the summer. It may not work during the winter, vice versa, or it may work for a year or it may not work at all. And you got to start the Sarah process all over again. So that's really an important problem model. Um, for solving and doing community policing. This is just kind of looking at the um, Sarah response. All right, efforts and assessment. There was what we call the CAPS program, which is the Chicago Alternative Police Strategy that came in. It's, it's one of the best examples um, that we looked at and assessed of community policing. Um, they s assigned officers in certain neighborhoods, um, they identified issues and it worked. There's also what we call civil abatement. A lot of calls that I used to go on were not police calls. They were what we call civil. Um, and those have to do with, again, the police get called out and they're not a policing issue. And the most common is landlord tenant. Um, many times I would go out to a call where the person would say, my landlord just raised my rent. And I know it's frustrating because the person doesn't know where to go, but there's actually civil abatement out there that handles these and many more um, issues that come up. Um, when I first started policing, we didn't have code enforcement officers. We started adding those officers. They, they were civilians, um, but they went out and looked at um, zoning issue, health department issue, other things that we understood were not policing issues. There was a smart um, program, which was Oakland Specialized Multi-Agency Response Team, um, that looked at doing civil abatement, and it was very successful. 
there's also a lot of weed and seed programs out there. It's the weeding of existing problems and seeding the area with positive things. Again, these are just new names or um, quick and easy names for community um, community policing different types. All right, here is a um, link where you can just go into YouTube and type in weed and seed empowering our community. This is only a two minute clip, but please make sure you go view this. All right, efforts and assessments. So here are some different programs that were done, um, such as the CCP program and the CACSI program acronyms. Oh my gosh, you know, 20 years ago, there were only certain acronyms and you could utilize them. Today, we have an acronym for everything. So um, please make sure when you use acronyms, you um, first identify what you're talking about. So if I use acronyms here, it's only because it's written out um, on the PowerPoint. All right, so with the Strategic Approaches to Community Safe Initiative, the lead agency was the U.S. Attorney's Office, which was unique, um, and they were attempting to build partnerships with other criminal justice agencies and open up those communication, which was great. You had Project Safe Neighborhoods. This is huge. Um, it focused on making neighborhoods safe, firearms violence. I have seen um, people put what we call shot speakers in certain areas so that if gunshots ring out, the police are called. Um, they have partnerships with different um, community um, leaders. Um, and the evaluations of these programs um, show that they really are successful and that they really do decrease what they're trying to stop, which makes sense. If you have a community coming at an issue from several different areas and you have coordination and a long-term approach, it kind of makes sense that you're going to have some success. All right, this is a um, quick video, three, three minutes, that I want you to go watch on the Project Safe Neighborhoods because this is a very popular program. All right, there's also a Operation Ceasefire in Boston. Um, this again addressed gangs, gun violence, juveniles, being in gangs. Um, it was an interagency partnership of police, probation, parole, immigration, housing, district attorney's office. Um, and there was, it was very positive results. Um, this is talking about the Operation Ceasefire in Boston. Um, it, again, this is about a six minute video, so please make sure you watch this. Um, there's also been crime and disorder partnerships done in the UK. Um, their goal, goal, again, was multi-dimensional with multi-dimensional responses. If we expect that calling the police is going to get us quickly an answer, I know that's easy and that's what we like today, fast and easy and quick, um, but unfortunately with crime and issues and disorder, it's not always a positive solution. All right, community-wide approach to gang prevention, intervention, and suppression programs. Um, it's been tough to build these programs, um, but they are successful um, when they are coordinated and they have a long-term effort. However, the impact on gang membership and crime is mixed depending on the actual approach utilized. Um, there's also business improvement districts. For example, we did a business um, watch, kind of like you have neighborhood watch, we did a business watch. Um, so those also um, have looked at mainly focusing on business owners and property owners and stopping um, graffiti and getting surveillance and more marketing and doing a lot of SEPTED um, initiatives, which you're gonna, you are all going to be doing um, next week. Um, and again, those have been positive results. All right, some of the problems and concerns. Obviously, implementation is tough. You need a lot of different people. The coordination is tough, and it takes a while. Um, and if you don't have the right people identifying community leaders to help out, that can be an issue as well. All right, there are a lot of successful partnerships out there, and these are the eight things that generally um, lead to a successful partnership. So obviously you need strong leaders. Two, you have to agree on the problem. So that's where the Sarah problem model comes in. Um, you have to recruit call qualified staff, research the problem. Again, that Sarah problem model. Um, build grassroots support, identify funding and resources, which can be tough. Provide a good oversight or assessment. Again, the Sarah problem model, and then evaluate your efforts. All right, that ends this. A little reminder, next week, your SEPTED review is due. 
I am expecting a lot on this. Um, this was back in week three that the assignment review checklist came out, their authorization letter, and I did an explanation. I'm not going to go back through that. If you want to go back to the video on this, you can. All your links are here. But again, this is a huge assignment worth a lot of points, so make sure you give it its due respect. Um, if you have any questions, please email me, but make sure you review all of these first along with the um, explanation I gave in week three. All right, we'll see you next week.